Good morning. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join in the call to worship. Blessed be God who shapes our dreams, whose love has conquered death. Blessed be God who orders our way and guides our steps, who leads us into life. can be against us. Let us confess our sins to the one who searches us and knows us. Please read with me. God who knows before we speak, we confess that we have turned away from you and have not lived with upright hearts. Forgive us for failing to follow you. Guide our feet to walk in your ways and serve your world to the glory of your name. Amen. Our sins are forgiven, be at peace, for all things work together for good for those who love God. to move around the room and say good morning to those worshiping nearby.
want to wish a warm welcome to everyone worshiping here in person and, and good morning and welcome to everyone who's visiting online. We're so glad you're here. For those online, you would mind to take a moment to say hello in the chat and let us know what you're worshiping with us and give thanks to God that you're here. For everyone here in person, if you notice the basket on your table, there are yellow slips inside. And if you fill out that yellow slip, you can put whatever information you like on it, and that allows us to know that you are here in person with us today in person. If you have a prayer request, the orange slips in the basket, um, you can fill that out and then put the both slips in the offering um, plate when it goes on later. My name is Jerusha Van Camp, and I am the parish visitor here at First Presbyterian Church. There are a few announcements in the life of the church. Uh, first, there are refreshments in the parlor, so you don't have to rush off after worship. You can stop by for a cup of coffee. You can even get up during worship if you want to get a cup of coffee and do that, grab a snack. It's a great uh, chance to say hello to someone you don't know. It is very hard to believe that school is starting very, very soon, and I'm pretty sure the teachers are going to be prepping this coming week, probably. Yes. Yep. Um, so... We are going to invite anyone who's an educator or student next Sunday. We're going to have a blessing of the backpack. So bring your backpack, bring your tote bag. I don't know if anybody carries briefcases anymore, but uh, bring it. And we're going to say a blessing, um, asking God to watch, to watch over all as we begin the new school year. And speaking of school, the education team here at First Press would love to add some fresh faces to the Sunday morning volunteer crew. So if you would like to help in the nursery or Sunday school, please contact Carrie Aiken, who is our lovely 830 vocalist, um, and she can tell you what that would entail. But most importantly, not really most importantly, but in two Sundays on August 13, we will have our Carrie in breakfast. That for, for me has always signaled the beginning of a new programming year, a chance where we're all back for hopefully our summer travels, and um, it's gonna be a great time of fellowship. So we invite you to come. Um, we, it will be at 9.30 a.m. here in the fellowship hall, and we will both have both services. They'll both be in the sanctuary. Um, bring a casserole, your favorite breakfast casserole, or some fruit or some pastries uh, to share with everyone, and um, I'm really looking forward to that time of fellowship. You can stay up to date on all the news and announcements in the, um, in the life of the congregation by reading the bulletin. Um, you can also get on our connect list, which is a weekly email that also, also gives you that information. You can put your email address on the yellow slip and we can get you on that list. We are very glad you're here, both in person and online. Let's continue our worship of God. Prayer for Illumination. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have made us in your image. Let our hearts, minds, and spirits be turned to you in this time so that the Holy Spirit may bring us closer to the word. Amen. I invite you to join me in reading the first 11 verses of Psalms 105. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forget forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan, as the portion you will inherit. Today's lesson from the New Testament comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought
purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the God, of Lord. Thanks be to God. And the New Testament lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out his storeroom new treasures as well as old. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Parables. They are a great vehicle for getting a message across in a way that people will remember. In most of the parables that Jesus told, it is followed with an explanation of what the parable meant. The disciples didn't have to figure out what the lesson was because Jesus told them, which was a good thing because by their questions, it was clear that sometimes they didn't always get it. In the parables that we just heard, except for the last one, there is no follow-up explanation. We are left to figure it out on our own. And I wondered, as I read these parables anew, how much we miss in these parables that are all too familiar because we have come to hear them in just one way. They've become static and too often fall on deaf ears instead of bringing life and hope. Jesus starts these parables with, the kingdom of heaven is like, like a farmer who planted in his field a mustard seed. 
He goes on to say that the kingdom of heaven is like a baker woman who puts a little bit of yeast into the flour, which becomes enough bread to feed a large crowd. So how is the kingdom of heaven like a farmer and a mustard seed, like a baker woman and a bit of yeast? I think the answer is found in what happens to the mustard seed and what happens to the flour and the yeast. The mustard seed becomes a huge plant, but it becomes more than that. I didn't know much about mustard plants, so I did a little reading about it, and I read that they grow and spread quickly like a weed and can quickly overtake the land it has been planted on. And as it tells us in the scripture, it becomes like a tree so large that the birds of the air come and perch on it. The birds symbolizing the people of nations who have lived under oppression. It is the same with the yeast and the flour. There are three things that strike me about these first two parables. The first is that action is taken. The farmer is sowing, the baker woman is baking. The seed is so tiny it can barely be seen, um, and when it is in the dirt, until it starts to grow, one wouldn't even know that it is even there. The same with the yeast and the flour. It just takes a little bit, and when it's blended with the flour, it cannot even be seen. Yet these small things that the farmer and the baker woman did results in big um, big things happening. Too often we look for the kingdom of heaven on earth and can't see it, but it's still there. What God has set in motion, what God is doing to make manifest God's kingdom on earth is happening, but oftentimes we have trouble seeing it. I think that comes from a couple of places, one being that we live too much in what we can see and hear and touch. The reality of global warming, of mass shootings, of poverty, of racial or gender discrimination is what we know. We can lose hope because of the onslaught of the terrible news. Where is God in all of this, some might ask. But God is here and the kingdom of heaven is here. It may be mixed up um, and just below the surface that we can't see, but it is still here, even if we don't notice it. Our eyes and our minds become stuck in what we see as reality, but there's always going more going on than meets the eye. I have had many patients and parishioners over the years wonder where God is in various situations of their lives. It is understandable to question where God is when life is harsh. But faith is hope and belief in things we cannot see. It's what we are told in Hebrews 11. The author writes, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction, the conviction of things not seen. In these parables, we are told to believe that the kingdom of heaven is here, even if we cannot see it at this exact moment. Things are not always as they seem. The kingdom is growing and will be made manifest to us in time. The second thing that I believe we are being told in these parables is that the kingdom of heaven is both seen and unseen. The problem is with the seen part is that it is in the ordinary. We may not recognize it because it is mixed up in other things, like in the flower. We have to ask God for eyes to see the kingdom of heaven. I think that when we are told to rejoice always and in everything to give thanks, this will help us to see God's purpose. The other evening, I stumbled upon a video of a man interviewing an elderly woman who was a survivor of Auschwitz. At one at one point, the man looked at her wrists and asked her if it was a burden for her to still have those numbers tattooed after all these years. Wasn't it a constant reminder to her of the suffering 
that she experienced and witnessed during her time in Auschwitz. And what she answered surprised me because her answer was no. Those numbers meant life. The ones who didn't get the numbers were put right into the gas chamber. When I got my numbers, I knew there was hope that I would live, and I did. I am grateful for those numbers, she said. She had stated that her mother had gone straight into the gas chambers and she had lost other relative, relatives in the camps. But for her, the numbers represented life and hope. When I was in college, I took a course on the Holocaust and my professor um, was a friend with Ellie Wiesel, survivor also of the Holocaust and author of the book Night. Um, she had arranged for us to go and hear him give a talk in New York City and to meet him afterwards. Before we went to New York for the lecture, she told us more about his personal journey of faith and hope after surviving the camp. She said for years that he vowed never to have children. He refused to bring a child into a world where humans could treat other humans so cruelly. And yet by the time I met him, he had become a father by choice. She talked about his transformation to seeing humanity as more good than evil, despite having seen human evilness at its extreme. And he came to affirm life, affirm God, affirm hope through bringing a new life into this world. The kingdom of heaven is there in the unseen, in the scene that is ordinary, in numbers on a wrist. But the third thing these first two parables tell us is that action is involved. God is both farmer and baker woman, sowing seeds, mixing yeast into the flour. But we are also to be the farmer and the baker woman as well. We are called to live lives of action, working to sow and mix into the world God's love. But more than that, we are never meant to live static lives but dynamic lives that are constantly mixing things up, upending things as the farmer did when he uh, turned the soil over, when the baker woman mixed the flour. We need to be mixing things up, stirring things up. That is what we are called to do, like the freedom writers who worked for justice in the 60s for civil rights. Like the youth who came out of Parkland um, advocating for gun regulation and made a whole student movement from that. The Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. These are people who are stirring things up, mixing things up, and that's what we are called as Christians to do, to let God's spirit move in the world through us to bring justice to those who have been suffering under oppression. We are to be the shakers and movers. The parable that comes next, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure found in a field and the man sold all that he had to buy the field. The same with the merchant who was looking for fine pearls, and when he finds one of great value, he sold everything he had to buy it. The kingdom of heaven is priceless. The promises we are given by God are priceless, and all that we possess is nothing in comparison. Would you sacrifice everything you had all your worldly possessions for the kingdom of God? Unless we realize that things are not what they seem to be and that they will not be as they are forever, as the leaven and the mustard seed reveal, one will miss what matters most, the pearl and the treasure, and substitute a God of lesser value and meaning 
People can gain the whole superficial world and yet lose their souls. As one commentator put it, because Jesus believes that one cannot serve God and mammon, or God and anything else for that matter, he proclaims the one thing needful. His teachings consistently reveal that the heavenly trumps the earthly, that the future trumps the present, and that we are surrounded by empty and dangerous distractions. To choose the pearl of great price or to dig up the treasure hidden in a field is to obey Jesus' imperative not to store up treasure for ourselves on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where where your heart is, there is where your treasure is. Jesus urges us to cast aside all but the single-minded pursuit of what should be our ultimate concern. And how does he do that? Persuaded that the true nature of things is not obvious, Jesus sets out in word and deed to fracture the hypnotic hold of life as it has always been. He seeks to shift our attention, to alter our perception, to expand our awareness, to change our behavior, because he, because he sanctions not the world as it is, where the kingdom is obscure, but only the world as it should be, when the kingdom will be all in all. He dislikes the default setting of our ordinary consciousness, whose defect is precisely that it accepts the present world as the real world. He is disconcerted that we see without seeing and fail to strive to enter through the narrow gate, and that we are so wedded to everyday life and find so much comfort in material things and the unstable circumstances of fleeting lives. So Jesus constructs these parables in the hope that we might begin to ponder soberly God's reign and perhaps even to seek it and hopefully to seek it above all else. May we be movers and shakers, and may we seek the kingdom of God above all else. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
to say what we believe using these words from the Confession of Belmont. We believe that God has entrusted the church through the message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ, that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker, that the church is witnessed both by word and deed, to the new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells, that God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death, and therefore also of irreconciliation and hatred, bitterness and enmity, that God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world. You may be seated. The one who sows a small number of seeds will also reap a small crop, and the one who sows a generous number of seeds will reap a crop, a generous crop. Let us share our offering to God in support of the kingdom of heaven.
let us pray. Gracious God, this offering is what we have to give you this day. Be it time, talent, or treasure, we lift these gifts to you. It is through you that all things are made new, and we ask that you renew our spirit to continue sharing our gifts with the least of us. Amen. This week, let us keep the following in our prayers uh, for one um, who is in a domestic violence shelter seeking safe housing, um, for Bill and Mary as they mourn the loss of Sue, for teachers and educators as they prepare to return to school, and for the students as well, places like Florida where they are literally um, short uh, hundreds, if not thousands of teachers who've quit. Um, continued prayers for Peggy Mastro Paola as she recovers and for her daughter Maria, for Suzanne Kohlmeyer and her mother Ruby, for Hugh McKinney who is preparing for a medical procedure, for all who are grieving, for all who are lonely and feel isolated, for all who are being treated for cancer, for those in our military and in militaries around the world who fight for justice and peace, for all of our friends and members who cannot worship with us in person, for those suffering from all types of dementia and mental health problems, and those who care for them, and for the congregation of the First Presbyterian Church in Spencer, Indiana, let us pray. Dear farmer and baker woman, God, we thank you that you are continuing to manifest your kingdom here on earth. That you have provided a mustard tree that provides the birds a place to rest. A place for us to find sanctuary in our pain. Sanctuary for those who live in disenfranchisement. Who live discriminated against. For all who, are, who suffer or have been outcast, you provide a place to rest and be comforted in your kingdom on earth. We pray for those who know no peace this morning, for those living in war zones who have lost loved ones to violent acts, for those who have lost freedom due to greed and wickedness, like the woman who saw hope and the numbers tattooed onto her wrists, give signs to all who need one today that would inspire them with hope and faith. We pray for those in this country and around the world who are suffering due to oppressive heat. We know that we never took your command to be stewards over this earth and to heart. In our selfishness and greed, we allowed ourselves dominance over your creation, which is not what you had ever intended. We pray for those to find a place to cool their overheated bodies. And we pray that all world leaders would believe in the science and come together to change our habits of destroying the planet. We pray for the innocent victims of climate change, the poor and homeless, who are suffering so much more than those who have means. We pray for the animals who are now finding themselves dying from thirst, from heat exhaustion, burnt paws, and hot pavement. For all of your creation that is suffering from heat this day, have mercy upon them. We pray for our church as we, head, as we think ahead to what you would like us to do and become. We know that you have planted a mustard seed within us. You have mixed your vision in the recesses of our brain. Help us to have vision to see what you would have us do to be a safe haven for those who are persecuted, to be a voice for the voiceless. We thank you that we don't have numbers tattooed on our wrists, but we would ask that if we were to ever come to that place of pain, we could be like that woman and see hope despite depression. You are the giver of all good gifts. Help us to see your goodness and love in the ordinary aspects of our lives and help us to seek the treasure of your kingdom over the material things we crave. Bless us and all who call on your name now in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. We pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. remembering that God has called you to be shakers and mixers in the world, to bring God's love, to bring God's peace, and to bring God's justice to those who are in need. Now go forth in thanksgiving for the gift of hope that never ends, knowing that we are more than victors through him who loves us. Amen. Thank you. 